I don't mind losing my reputation. What about you? I don't mind, I don't mind being tortured. What about you? I'm just no longer afraid and I've lost interest in this old world of capitalist sin. And racism, I've lost interest in it. So if somebody wants to make me stay in it by compromising with filthy-minded people that cannot even have respect for somebody who would die for even his enemies, and they want to cause anarchy in our midst, I would just as soon bring it all to a gallant, a glorious screaming end. Bring it to a screeching stop in a one glorious moment of triumph. So you think about it. Welcome to Transmissions from Jonestown. You're listening to Episode 1, The People's Temple. On November 18, 1978, an entire community of United States citizens died deep in the jungle of Guyana. At the command of their charismatic leader, Reverend Jim Jones, 909 members of the People's Temple Agricultural Project lost their lives. Some believed they were committing a revolutionary act of suicide. Others were forced or coerced by the group. A colorful, toxic mix of Flavor-Aid, Kool-Aid, and Cyanide was passed around in Dixie cups. For those unable or unwilling, the mixture was administered using syringes. Take our life from us. We laid it down. We got tired. We didn't commit suicide. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. Where's the vat? The vat? The vat? Where's the vat with the green seas? Eh? Go on for the the end. And thank you, Dad. The vat with the green sea in, please. Bring it here so the adults can begin. Mother, 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 please. Mother, please, 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 don't, don't do this, don't do this. Get down your life with your child, but don't do this. Talking to them, all they're doing is taking a drink to take to go to sleep. I with respect die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. There's nothing to death. It's like Max said, it's just stepping over in another plane. Don't, don't be this way. Most of us have heard the story. An egomaniacal madman and his brainwashed cult of zombie followers commit mass suicide in the heart of darkness. Nothing more than a cautionary tale reminding us all to think for ourselves and never, ever drink the Kool-Aid. I want to tell you today, for your good, allow no one here to praise anything else or talk about anything else except what I am. Don't let anyone else tell you, you to get so your mind so off all this something. other, Are there such, such this, a, this poopy crack. You better just get off of it. That helped that wounded me. I was the you only one that got that they only I speak of one, one God, God, God for Davis. You, I, I was the only one that one God with the things I cannot here even mention talking here. To you. Don't, don't let them talk about any other God. I will have no God before me. I am God, and there is no other God before me. Drink the Kool-Aid. The phrase itself means to give up, to submit all will and simply go with the flow, to not question the logic behind choices and follow the herd. This idea was greatly applied to the handling of Jonestown evidence after the massacre. Bodies were left out in the jungle sun to rot for days, making autopsy or toxicology impossible. Evidence was covered up, lost, and mishandled. The media was misinformed, and family members were kept in the dark for days or even weeks. The government depended on the idea of the public's blind faith in the drink the Kool-Aid scenario. Just go with the flow and don't question things too closely. Several years ago, I was watching a television show about the 70s and there was a segment about Jonestown. The program featured audio clips from a tape infamously known as the Death Tape, an approximately 45 minute long recording made in the pavilion of Jonestown while people drank the Kool-Aid. It contained audio of Jones ranting about death and loyalty, revolutionary suicide, and the consequences of not following through with the mass destruction of the community. I noticed that the recording contained several layers of hard-to-hear audio. I immediately sought out the complete recording so I could analyze it. How very much I've loved you. 
How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. Apparently, resources in Jonestown were limited, so tapes were often recycled and recorded over and over. I noticed that the death tape itself had been heavily edited, and there were several layers of audio layered on top of each other. Once I had isolated these recordings, I became incredibly interested in Jonestown. There is a lot more to the People's Temple than what you see in a random documentary. I sent the isolated recordings to the Jonestown Institute, an organization known for archiving the history of the People's Temple. Literally hundreds of recordings were found in Jonestown after the massacre. The task of digitizing and transcribing these recordings was monumental, but I was happy to help. The more I listened to the recordings of the People's Temple, the more curious I became as to what happened and why. My name is Mike Probst. I came to People's Temple almost six years ago to do a documentary for television on Jim Jones and his movement. I resigned my job as a news bureau chief and joined People's Temple because I saw it was the greatest cause for social justice. I'm Lisa Layton. I was born in Germany and I left Germany because I'm Jewish and came to the United States thinking that I might find freedom. However, I realized My name is Loretta Coomer. At the age of 40, I look back at 1953 and 54, when I was with People's Temple as a teenager. We moved from one church to the other because of harassment, because of our stand for equality of races. Moved from one area My of town to the John Harris, and I'm a proud member of People's Temple. And I have been for some eight years, and now I'm proud to say that I'm a communist. I'm Helen uh, Swinney. Uh, we debated this... Uh, um, uh, suicide for many, many hours here tonight, and I've made up my mind that this is the way I prefer going because I've been in this group for uh, almost 20 years now. I pray and I hope that this tape will at least survive in portions so that they can know what we stood for. I'm glad that my death will mean something. I hope it will be an inspiration to all people that fight for freedom all over the world. The details of these people's lives, their beliefs, and how or why they died are disregarded as trivial facts that only distract from the sheer enormity of death that has become the symbol of Jonestown. But as many have said before, Jonestown did not exist in a vacuum. The more I researched the events, I realized that not to question what happened and simply assume that people that are brainwashed or join a cult have no power over their own moral choices is a dangerous concept. Are we to assume that Susan Atkins didn't have any choice when she killed Sharon Tate? These people made choices. They created a reality for themselves and their families based upon utopian ideals and radical socialist concepts. They built a new society based on the principles of equality and communal living. Many of the citizens of Jonestown toiled 10 hours a day to build and maintain what they called the promised land. Really, it's the most beautiful place I've ever been in all my life. I just love it. I hope everything is going to be all right for us. Though many who joined People's Temple were poor, they were not stupid, unskilled, or worthless. In fact, joining an organization that celebrated their skills and intelligence while nurturing their feelings of self-worth was the exact reason people joined the People's Temple. For the disenfranchised and the unconventional, Jim Jones and his super groovy modern movement was a way to get involved, a reason to believe, and a way to a better life. How many guests do we have in our assembly today? We're happy to have you. Hold your hands up, please, so that some worker can come and sit by you and familiarize you with truth and some of the things that we are doing that would be fascinating to you. We are so happy to have you in our midst. We welcome you from the depths of our heart. People's Temple is a nation. It constitutes children's homes, senior citizen homes, convalescent sanatoriums, promised land of 25,000 acres, preparation for concentration camps. We are ready for everything that oppressors want to bring our way. Many love their leader, James Warren Jones, who they called father. To some, a mentor, healer, guardian, and prophet. To others, a fascist dictator, socialist comrade, co-conspirator, or even frightening disciplinarian. The many faces of Jim Jones evolved and adapted according to the needs of the temple leadership. 
Jones was famous for saying that the end always justified the means, even if that implied bribery, intimidation, violence, or murder. But let's not jump too far ahead. James Warren Jones was born in 1931 at the height of the Great Depression in a poor rural community of Indiana. Growing up, Jones' childhood friends referred to him as a really weird kid who was obsessed with death and religion. Jones loved animals and kept several in cages on his parents' property. His childhood friends would come to see the animals and end up staying for hours while a tiny Jim Jones gave sermons and held mock funerals in his barn. This spooky behavior left unchecked by his parents alienated him from his peers as a child, leaving him isolated and often lonely. I think that I should um, take a knife and cut Mr. Tupper all up real good. (laughs) (laughs) Cut him up real good. And then make him look like, you know, um, cut him up and then put poison in him and invite all, all my relatives over there and have him eat him and then I'll die. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom is a damn fool. I hope I, I, hope I knock the fucking shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Jones was an intelligent child, always reading, interested in communism, civil rights, religion, and the inner workings of the human mind. Growing up, he attended old-time religious services, learning the power of evangelical influence over the zealous, the superstitious, the poor, and the vulnerable. He also attended communist rallies, which helped him form the idealistic concepts of anti-capitalist communal living Jonestown was built on. Well, they'll, they'll ask you point blank, are you socialist? Surely I believe in this communal type of living. I believe in a cooperative lifestyle. I believe in a nonviolent socialism. Loving communism in the McCarthy era was social suicide, and Jim Jones realized preaching in a religious setting was a powerful and safe way to share his ideas and create a movement based on communism without getting blacklisted. He spent time at the Seventh-day Baptist Church where he learned that performing faith healings was a productive means of income as well as a quick way to build a fellowship. Jones also spent time with Father Divine, the leader of one of America's first religious cults. Father Divine was the leader of the International Peace Mission Movement, a predominantly black religious organization centered around the ideas of communal living and racial equality. His followers looked to him as a living God. They gave up their homes and estates to live in one of the many communes run by the cult. They believed not being loyal to Father Divine or doubting his evangelical power could kill a man. Jones had learned how a man of meager means from Baltimore had traveled to the South spreading homegrown socialism to the poor huddled masses using nothing more than the pulpit. Father Divine drove a Cadillac, lived in luxury, swayed votes in local elections, ran several businesses, and at one time had a following in the tens of thousands. Maybe more importantly than that, Divine Preach, which may have been, to Jim Jones, the number one injustice in all the world, the plight of the disenfranchised African American. After Father Divine's death, Jones unsuccessfully attempted to hijack the international peace mission movement, only to be denied by Father Divine's surviving wife, Edna Rose. In 1956, Jim Jones finally had a church of his own, the People's Temple in Indianapolis. There he would preach racial integration and perform his faith healings, He no longer needed to censor his sermons or use any subtlety in his doctrine. Reverend Jones' Pentecostal preaching style and unconventional services drew a mixed bag of followers. Most were poor black families, many elderly, but most of what later became the church's core administration was well-educated and white. These were his co-conspirators that had first-hand knowledge of how the show was run behind the scenes. They helped him fake faith healing ceremonies by gathering information about people, going through people's garbage, and even pretending to be healed on stage. Oh, that's all right. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I hear a doctor's name. I know nothing of you personally. I know none of your, nothing of your life personally, and you've told no one here anything. Is that correct? That's correct. I hear a Charles A. Mayfield. Yes. Yes. Now. Oh, thank you. Ikramanasama. I should say that in July of last year, you were x-rayed. Yes. You've told no one here. No one. 
There's difficulty in your back, yes. in your abdomen. Yes. Mirka and Disha, Mahani, Nira, Masa. Oh, yes. Hands clasped. Oh, yes. Libra transparent <laughs> face powder. You know that? Yes, yes, my God. Oh, yes. 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 Well, what we said about never miles nerving capsules and any material that has to do with Reverend Ike. Oh, yes. Remove it from your oh, home. Yes, God, I brought it out. I can do it. I can do it. Yes, yes I brought it out. Oh, All right. Yes, now, now, sister, sister, yes. go, go to the bathroom, and the cancer that's in your body will pass in your body. Go. They can't keep her with a microphone. Here she comes. The cancer's Just deadly turn now. Just know because it's Here happened she all. Oh, she's give her, she gives the pastor a hug. She gives the prophet a big hug. She's so grateful that the cancer's been removed. There's the mask. Look at that bloody mask. There's the mask. Thought, being held in a white napkin, a large paper towel. Paper towel. Yes, crazy. Many people's temple members believe Jones could cure cancer, blindness, or take away a person's pain at will a skill he proved to his congregation again and again with the help of his inner circle and the People's Temple leadership. His wife, Marceline, would hide bits of raw chicken liver in her hands, and when an afflicted, usually a plant in the audience, received Jim's blessings, the cancer would eject itself from their body. Many of his flock believe Jones had an almost magical quality when you were in his presence. When he spoke to an entire congregation, you'd feel as though he spoke directly to you, like he could see inside your soul. And you that don't clap, I'm watching you. I've got eagle eyes. I'm watching you. Listen, brother, I'm asking you in the balcony, why aren't you clapping? I'm talking to you in that balcony. Now you stand by me. People wanted to nail you to the cross for something you'd done, which I wouldn't dream of doing, but I, I covered and cared for you and overcame the problem. And then you have other gods before me. You should be ashamed of yourself. Jones was also celebrated for his powerful sexuality. From early in the church's history, Jones had several lovers and close relationships with young, attractive women in the temple. He didn't try to hide this fact. He often talked about sex and relationships in his sermons, and even regarded himself as an incredible lover with mystical sexual abilities. He was also alleged to have had homosexual relationships with some of the men. He swore and often made odd and blasphemous remarks during his sermons but his congregation fed off the wild energy of these services. I wasn't, I wasn't even beginning to think about crying over myself, but just now in a moment it hits me. I don't know what the fuck it is all about. What the fuck we, what, what, what the fuck some of us beating our asses off night and day, and you people won't even rise above your vaginas and your dicks. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. Just so I can get you cool down, because you consider the woman an emotional animal. And if you, you get her under control, get her all cool down, so you can fuck her next time she goes to Georgetown. I know you pricks. Love, I'll tell you, sweet, you don't listen. You goddamn people get your twat going, and it gets itchy, and the dick gets itchy, and you don't give a shit who you're laying up to. They can be a goddamn snake, and you still lay up next to it. You, have you fucked him since? You fucked him since? Okay. Then what the hell do you fuck? How the hell a guy gonna know mad? How you gonna know he's mad when you're fucking him? Assholes who can't even fuck. I could fuck 15 times a day and I gotta worry about all this shit. In the beginning, the movement was all about integration and equality. The mayor of Indianapolis appointed Jones the director of the Human Rights Commission. Jones led several civil rights demonstrations and was credited with integrating the first movie theater in Indiana. He helped integrate hospitals, schools, churches, restaurants, Needless to say, he wasn't very popular with the right-wing conservatives in the early 60s. Jones's rhetoric was becoming increasingly political and more militant. That poppycock of sky god and flyaway religion never helped any of us. We don't want none of it here. And if you talk about any of that other religion, I don't want to hear nothing about your Bibles or your religion. I only want to hear you tell me how we're going to build a free society out of this earth. I want to hear about a heaven on earth, and I don't want to hear nothing else. Doubtless, Jones was already on an FBI watch list along with the Black Panthers and similar politically motivated groups of the time. You could barely buy a book without ending up on somebody's shit list. You certainly couldn't take a trip to South America or outwardly support communism without the CIA opening a file. But that's exactly what Jim Jones did. 
Unfortunately for us, Jim Jones' file with the CIA and FBI were eventually purged. There's just nothing there. For someone with so many obvious red flags, how could he just be ghosted like that, and why? This was a time in our history unlike any other. A cultural revolution was brewing. Counterculture movements were under the constant watch of intelligence agencies. Phones were bugged and groups were infiltrated. The government was experimenting with drugs and mind control. They were destroying movements from the inside out and creating a giant network of drug dealers, arms dealers, illegal international traders, and guerrilla armies. Total disdain for the government and mistrust of authority was already a daily part of the People's Temple infrastructure. A sort of mounting paranoia that was affecting not just Jim Jones and the People's Temple, but the entire country. Vietnam, Cuba, JFK, and the counterculture movements were all happening. The Cold War was blowing full blast. Jim Jones started preaching about nuclear war. This Haiphong Russian roulette playing with uh, nuclear war, and you see, I'm horrified by it because I have given the date, the month, and the year where nuclear war will take place. I want to be like Jonah of old. I want to be proven wrong. Jonah got mad when his prophecy went wrong. See, God showed him Nineveh was going to be destroyed, and then God decided not to, and Jonah got mad because he didn't get the, the prophecy carried out, supposedly. Jonah didn't, uh, he wasn't happy that his own prophecy hadn't been carried out. I'll be happy if one of my prophecies fail. They haven't yet, but I'll be glad when one of them does. Sometime in 1961, our story takes a bizarre turn. Jim Jones resigns from the Indianapolis Human Rights Commission and leaves People's Temple in the hands of his associate pastor. Jones has had an apocalyptic vision and decides to travel abroad. According to his biographers, he first travels alone to Hawaii. It was there that Jones read an Esquire magazine article about the nine safest places to survive nuclear fallout. Belo Horizonte, Brazil was on that list. Jones made his way to South America, stopping in Guyana where it is believed he did some missionary work with the Amerindians. Oddly enough, newspapers in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana, reported Jones making anti-communist speeches at this time. This is very out of character for Jones. For a period of about six months, Jones disappears for a while. The next sighting we have of Jones is in Cuba where he and his wife had their photograph taken with Fidel Castro just months after the Bay of Pigs. Jones had more than one passport issued around this time. The first was issued in Chicago in 1960. We know he used it to travel to Guyana. The second was issued in Indianapolis in 1962, which is odd because Jones and his family were living in Brazil at this time. So who applied for or picked up this passport? Jones' erratic behavior, his willingness to leave behind the temple he worked so hard to build, are good indications that something strange was happening. Many people believe it is around this time that Jones became involved with the MK Ultra project or was recruited into the CIA. South America in the 70s, as you will hear in later broadcasts, is fraught with guerrilla warfare, CIA covert operations, and political upheavals. Having multiple passports and possible body doubles with bad mustaches is pretty suspicious. Jim Jones and his family up to this point had lived a relatively modest and frugal lifestyle they suddenly found themselves living in luxury in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Where the money came from was a mystery. Jones claimed he was teaching at the university or that he worked at a Eureka Laundries, depending on who asked him. He even claimed to be a gigolo scamming rich old ladies or a Korean war vet receiving checks from the government monthly. All were lies. No one knows where he went all day or what he was up to. We do know that Jones was seen by neighbors leaving for work early in the morning wearing a beige suit and clutching a leather briefcase. A car from the U.S. Consul would often be parked outside the Jones residence and was seen delivering groceries and packages to the Joneses. A communication is sent to Jones from John Londison, a CIA agent. The note stated that John needed to see Jones at the U.S. Consul. Attached to the note was a passport picture slightly resembling Jones if he had a receding hairline and a bad mustache. A local newspaper reported that Jones and his family were suspected CIA agents trying to spy on the Brazilian government. In fact, there was a detective in the Brazilian police department investigating allegations, but the detective died before his investigation was complete. 
Jones had an old acquaintance living in Belo Horizonte. As a child, Jones had preached on the streets of Richmond, Indiana. There, he met a police officer by the name of Dan Mitrioni. Later, Dan Mitrioni joined the FBI and moved to Brazil to train law enforcement in advanced counterinsurgency techniques. His expertise in counter-guerrilla warfare and torture techniques made him useful in takeovers of South American National Socialist movements. He was a professional when it came to influencing people who opposed the law or government. He punished dissenters and used violent interrogation techniques. Later in his career, Mitrioni is kidnapped and killed by guerrilla fighters in Uruguay. It is around this time that Jones' CIA file was purged. It boggles the mind that Jones would work so hard for the civil rights movement, only to join the CIA so he could torture the very people he defended and admired. There are nine more months unaccounted for in this segment of our timeline. Jones is said to have worked for the CIA-owned Invesco in Rio, where he failed as a salesman. For a guy who was good at selling monkeys door-to-door, -door, that's ironic. Finally, in 1963, Jones and his family returned to Indiana to gather their flock. Jones now claimed to believe the world would be engulfed in nuclear war by 1967 and wanted to move the People's Temple to Ukiah in Redwood Valley, California. They loaded up the buses and moved everyone they could. Upon his return, the People's Temple message had become less spiritual and much more political. Jim Jones now often referred to the Bible as propaganda and would toss it across the room to make a show of how little it mattered in the face of social injustice. I've sincerely and conscientiously not only attempted to prove, but I have proven that you cannot base your faith upon the Bible. Did you get what I said here tonight? Until something's proven empirically, Epistemological concepts, whatever your conceptual ideas, they have to make a juxtaposition with reality someplace so that you know by empirical evidence that what you have said was reality is tested to be reality and proven to be reality. Settling in the small rural community of Ukiah, the People's Temple inserted themselves into local politics and purchased tons of real estate. They owned child care facilities, thrift stores, old folks' homes, motels, apartment buildings. To the predominantly white community, the invasion of mostly black counterculture revolutionary neighbors in the mid-60s would have drawn some attention. Marceline Jones and several members of the People's Temple worked at the Mendocino County State Hospital. This hospital was part of an experiment to deinstitutionalize the mentally ill. As California deinstitutionalized its large state facilities, the People's Temple funneled residents to People's Temple-run halfway houses and care facilities, including a 40-acre ranch called Happy Acres. As it was being essentially liquidated, the state hospital was also alleged to have been one of the many hospitals experimenting with LSD, electrotherapy, and mind control techniques as part of the MK Ultra program. Right on. As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against such fundamental laws of nature as self-preservation. I was a subject in radiation as well as mind control and drug experiments performed by a man I knew as Dr. Green. I was a subject from 1966 to 1976. All these experiments were performed on me in conjunction with mind control techniques and drugs. Uh, well, we told them, uh, I don't think that they would have even known what LSD was then at the time. They were told that they were going to give, they would be given some medication which might make them feel worse. These are days when America's house is on fire and we are in grave danger. Now we, uh, $300 we don't like to sacrifice, but it's a worthy investment if we can do anything to stop what they've got in mind here in California. Give us a little bit more time to get ourselves together so we can get out of here or get on our way when the bomb falls to get on our way to protection because they are now talking of experimentation. He kept saying UCLA, that's University of California. They've already done lobotomies there on people who really they're not sure of the consent they got. He didn't portray it half as bad as it is. They're already doing chemical, uh, chemical therapy, altering with drugs in the prisons. Senator Kennedy told us last week they're doing it in the feeble-minded institutions. They're doing it in the uh, mental institutions. They're already doing this. You can do nothing 
There's no use to talk about trying to stop this altering of, of the mind with drugs. There's no use to talk about brain surgery being stopped until you get these fat capitalists off the scene. Until the money mongers are off the scene, there will always be this dealing with the minds, altering the human behavior, because what they want is every black person to go on as a slave. And they're trying to give them passive drugs, passive uh, surgery that will dissect and by incision and by uh, chemistry, uh, introduction of drugs to alter their behavior so that they will not question the dirty, stenching, smelling ghettos that they're living in, and they will not quarrel with the fact that they're making half the wages of the white person, or they will not quarrel with the fact that they are sent over to Vietnam to fight the rich man's war. They're trying to get a whole breed of automatons. People's Temple was recruiting new members from nearby impoverished communities in Oakland and San Diego. As People's Temple membership grew, so did the number of social security checks cashed each month by the temple. The people lived and worked in temple-run homes and businesses, long hours with very little pay. The harder you worked, the greater proof of one's loyalty. They bust hundreds of PT members into large cities for political rallies and revivals. The counterculture movement was a bustling economy for People's Temple recruiters. By the early 70s, the People's Temple had moved its headquarters to San Francisco. Jones had effectively run an entire city using only his own people. In a big city like San Francisco, it was important for Jim to have some friends in high places. He filled the temple buses full of people dressed in their Sunday best, willing to vote or rally for whomever Jones told them to. Soon this gave Jim Jones influence in local government. People's Temple played a large role in getting Mayor George Moscone elected. Allegedly, People's Temple members bust in from all around to vote for Moscone, sometimes more than once. Grateful to the temple, Moscone appointed Jim Jones chairman of the San Francisco Housing Authority. This gave Jones direct access and control over more impoverished people in the Bay Area. The People's Temple was praised for its social services and Jim Jones had gained a reputation with many powerful people. He met with First Lady Rosalind Carter, presidential candidates, governors, and famous civil rights activists like Angela Davis. But behind closed doors, Jim Jones was becoming increasingly paranoid. Loyalty to People's Temple was equated with loyalty to Jim Jones himself and any desertion or defection of any member was taken as a direct insult to Jones and an outright act of terrorism against the movement. Okay. Uh-huh. Mike Pearls. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Oh, fine. Haven't heard from you for a while. Jim just want to know what your attitude and feelings are at this point. Yeah, I mean, my attitude is okay. It's just that uh, I just really think it's just too much for me. And uh, I know that I can't, you know, continue to be a part of... Uh, PC and not, you know, be there and stuff. And, you know, I have no problems in coming to church, you know. It's just that uh, I have a problem staying up all night and trying to work and going to school and going to meetings twice a week. And, you know, I mean, I just I just cannot hack that. And then maybe it was an, if it was the nature of a meeting that I was going to that had some end results, you know, I mean, in my mind, there they're none. I mean, I'm just saying that I, I just know that emotionally I cannot just stay up like that and function like a normal person. I just can't do it. All right. Uh, I'll pass it along and possibly get back to you. Jim Jones enlisted the inner circle of People's Temple leaders known as the Planning Commission to spy on Temple members. Spying on his flock was something he had always done. It came in handy to know intimate facts about someone's health status or family history when conning them into believing they had been healed by divine powers. Digging through people's trash, accessing public records, and tapping phones were all part of the routine. But now that Jones held some real power, the diabolical methods of data warehousing his people became more Orwellian. He encouraged his followers to donate not just their assets, but to sign away the custody of their children. He coerced people into signing false documents stating they had molested and abused their children, as well as committed heinous crimes, as a show of loyalty. A good friend and loyal partner to Jim Jones was Tim, the assistant DA for Mendocino County. Tim helped facilitate the signing of many of these documents. Children were encouraged to rat out their parents if they suspected defection. Before long, People's Temple members were paranoid and distrustful of each other. They were learning to only trust father and also to fear him, as most believed he could see into their minds. 
This is just a short note from me to let you know that life outside of people's temple is hell. Life away from our Father is unbearable. We all realize our mistake and hope that others can learn from this. All must realize that in this time of much trouble and oppression, that the only safe place is with Father, that nothing can be accomplished without Father. We've got to put an end to rebellion or we won't be able to get this group to a point of safety. Well, when are you going to stop to think, young man, that if everybody flared off, this organization might as well be destroyed and I stop? People were often publicly humiliated by Jones or beaten for whatever crime, whether real or imagined, they had committed. Often the accused in these situations believed Jones had psychic powers, when in reality it was their family and friends spying on them. Stupid ass motherfucker! That's right. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hey, you, you, you can avoid this shit you'd have confessed the last night. That's right, Dumbass. Hit him in the butt. Hit him in the balls. Hit him in the balls. Hit him. <laughs> Marriages were arranged and split apart. Families reorganized. People were accused of being homosexual or of promiscuity. Something Jones himself knew a lot about. It was clear that designing families was part of the structure of People's Temple, a micromanaging technique that would become more oppressive later in Jonestown. Get close. Assemble yourselves closely this week. Get around and be close whenever you can. I love you. Jones spoke constantly of plots against People's Temple by outside forces like the FBI, CIA, or law enforcement. He lived in constant fear of what he called the fascist capitalists that he claimed set fire to his churches, tortured their animals, and had even tried to assassinate him. But what Jim really feared was the possibility of People's Temple defectors and how what they knew could destroy the organization from the inside out. Many stories about ex-Temple members turning up dead were circulated. Some had substance, but none were ever proven. All the same, this drew negative attention to Jones and his practices. As the movement became more restrictive, disciplined, and militant, of course there were some defectors. People's Temple members Elmer and Deanna Myrtle left the temple after their daughter was severely beaten with a paddle at a temple service. They changed their names to Al and Jeannie Mills and started the Human Freedom Center to help others that wanted to leave the temple. Jones was becoming more emotionally unstable. His fear of being exposed to the world was becoming real as more and more defectors began to speak out against the temple. To leave People's Temple, you had to decide you'd rather die than, than continue to go there and see the beatings and, and the mistreatment of people, the rip-off of senior black people from their homes, all their property. Uh, you had to decide that you were ready to die when you left the church. Deep in the jungles of Guyana, the People's Temple had leased several acres of land. There, a small settlement had been built. They called it Jonestown, the People's Temple Agricultural Project. Despite harsh jungle conditions and dense canopy, they had managed to build several cottages, a school, a clinic. They planted crops and even raised some livestock. It was supposed to be a paradise, a land of equality, living all for one in a socialist system, away from the injustices of the world. This is our socialist land, a place of equality. We have won the victory. Working and living in a land that is free. This is our socialist land. Father gave it to me. Oh, this is our socialist Hi, my name is Ronald Bagman. It's it's nice over here and everybody likes um everybody likes it over here and I'd be glad when you guys get to come over here because it's it's just the it's, it's joy and scene when when you get to see all you um people back there and Father, Father loves all of us. Hello, family. It's been a, it's, it's such a joy and great pleasure being here because of Father's love. We are trying to make, and we are making a place of refuge for all of you here. I love it here, and this is the place where all of you are going to be. In 1976, Jones decided to test the scope of his influence over his people. Cups were passed around, and the people were told to drink the poison liquid. After an emotional ceremony of devotional eulogies and agonizing dirges, 
They were told that this had only been a test, a test of loyalty, and they had all passed. Several relatives of People's Temple members and PT defectors formed the Concerned Relatives Group. The suicide drills and increasingly bizarre activities of the temple had prompted public interest. The Concerned Relatives began a campaign to investigate Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Stories about public beatings, suspicious social security checks, and disappearances of ex-Temple members began to circulate amongst the press. On August 1, 1977, New West published a damning news article. It speculated about where People's Temple got its money. Even more damaging to the temple were the eyewitness accounts of child abuse. Jim Jones panicked. This trickle of negative press would soon turn into a tidal wave that would defame him as a con man and destroy the organization. Jim Jones moved to Jonestown to avoid being investigated. His people followed him to Guayana, seeking a life free from oppression. At this point in our story, things get pretty strange. Jim Jones' drug use increases. His health deteriorates. He becomes even more paranoid, distrusting all of his followers and dragging them with him down into the rabbit hole, raging endlessly into the night against an unseen foe, against all the injustices of an inhumane world. But I don't ever say hate is your enemy. Love has practically caused me to just get you destroyed. If I had hated a little more, just a little more, we would have had a little less trouble. Because I look at my faults analytically. Sure, you got to love. Principle! Love is the only weapon. Shit! Bullshit! Martin Luther King died with love! Kennedy died talking about something he couldn't even understand, some kind of generalized love, and he never even backed it up! He shot down! Bullshit! Love is the only weapon with which I got to fight. I got a hell of a lot of weapons to fight. I got my claws, I got compasses, I got guns, I got dynamite, I got a hell of a lot to fight! I'll fight! I'll fight! Let them hear it in the night! On the next episode of Transmissions from Jonestown. In 1981. I'm very emotionally disturbed with another traitor who has stolen our money. And I'll get every last damn one of them. I want to tell you, every last damn one of them will die. Jerry, the question would be, if the fascists were coming and we were going to lay down our lives and fight for it, you say you would give your life for your child, but would you leave it for the fascists to have? What would you do in that case? I'm asking for the closest scrutiny of my food. I was attempted to be poisoned last evening. They tell the most horrible tales. They whip up dreams of madness out of their own nightmares and evil souls. The Attention Span Recovery Project would like to thank the Jonestown Institute and the anonymous contributors. If you have any questions or comments about this program, you can contact us at radiojonestown at gmail.com or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Radio Jonestown. End transmission. This is a bag of garbage, just like any other bag of garbage that you and I throw away several times a week. But former members of the People's Temple say their pastor, the Reverend Jim Jones, used bags of garbage like this along with other things in order to create revelations before his congregation. Well, we obtained names of people who had come into the meetings um, for the first time or else someone who had written a letter asking for help. Uh, we'd take their names and their addresses, uh, go to their homes, and talk with them, get any information. We would go in disguise, of course, so that they wouldn't know we were from People's Temple. 
uh, get any information we could at all, any of their personal information, uh, description of their house, where they lived, uh, any little mementos in their house that were very personal, anything that would make them believe that there was no way that anyone other than God himself could have that information. What was their reaction when he sprung that on them in a church meeting? <laughs> very effective. They really did think that he was God.